Hi, my name is Miguel Altieri. I'm a professor of agroecology at UC Berkeley, and today I'm going to be talking about the use of agroecological practices to enhance the resilience of organic farms to drought. As you know, um, climate change predictions is that in the future, temperatures are going to increase, we're going to have longer growing seasons, less frost, warmer nights. Um, there's going to be some precipitation changes. In some cases, we're going to have more flooding, more droughts. And also, there's going to be increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. And this, obviously, is going to vary according to the region of the world in which we're talking about. Uh, the IPPC, <clears throat> which is the panel on, on, on climate change, um, predicts that um, because of emissions that are going to continue increasing, uh, we're going to have probably changes in global temperature uh, on average between two, which would be severe, and four degrees centigrade, which would be catastrophic in terms of effects not only on agricultural production, but in general on the livelihoods of the planet. So here we can see some predictions that uh, the IPPC has done in terms of what would happen with some of the uh, crop yields uh, of maize, soybean, Asia, Asian rice, wheat, uh, maize in Africa, and so on. As you can see, the red dot is the, the rises in temperature. And as the temperature goes above two degrees, um, there is a, a starts a drop in, in the yields of these crops. <clears throat> and some of the effects of these extreme uh, climate change events, for example, Increased precipitation leads to flooding, which basically destroys whole areas of agriculture, and drought that um, affects um, the yields of most crops that are not able to survive without water. So in California, um, the predictions are is that the annual mean surface temperatures are, are going to increase, and that we will have fewer frost days, uh, longer growing seasons, and more heat waves and more warm nights. And also, there's going to be a decline in the, in the number of chilling hours. Uh, many fruits and nut crops will not be commercially viable in large areas of California if you know, the, uh, the chilling hours are expected to be half during the, done during the 1980s. And then, obviously, because of changes in temperature and humidity, there may be more problems with some pests, uh, insect pests and diseases and, and, and weeds, and also more invasive species. Uh, could also become a problem that adapt to these new climate scenarios in, in the region. So one of the questions that we have is, uh, are our agricultural systems in California prepared to confront climate change? And uh, most of the uh, researchers that have been doing work on this uh, predict that because of historical trends, large-scale genetically homogeneous monocultures are, are very vulnerable, not only to climate change, but also has been shown that they're very vulnerable to diseases and pests and so on. And in this slide, we can see the changes in, from one century ago in the number of varieties that we have of different crops that have, you know, we used to have 200, 300 varieties of beets and cabbage, and today we have maybe 17 or 20 that dominate the agricultural landscapes. And this genetic homogeneity, back in 1972, the National Academy of Sciences um, basically sent a warning saying that the resulting genetic homogeneity and uniformity can lead to greater susceptibility to pathogens. And, and that really um, <clears throat> set the motion for some people to start saying, look, uh, we, our agricultural systems are too vulnerable and we need to uh, make them more resilient to not only to climate change, but also to diseases and so on. So how uniform genetically are crops upon which the nation depends and how vulnerable? Um, the answer is that most major crops are impressively uniform genetically and impressively vulnerable. And this was uh, witnessed not too long ago in the, in the drought of 2012 uh, in the Midwest, where there were record uh, temperatures, record drought in 50 years. And um, the results are quite impacting in that actually corn production dropped more than 1 to 15%, and soybean production also fell about 10%. So this can also lead to several problems, inc including the increase of food prices. When, when yields go down, then that creates problems with, uh, at the consumer level because food prices go up. So what do we need to do then? Is we, start, we need to start building agricultural resilience. That is, the first thing we need to understand is the potential exposures and impacts on productivity. Some systems are much more exposed to others. 
We need to understand the sensitivities of agricultural systems. Some systems are more sensitive than others, and therefore we need to define some critical thresholds and interactions. And then we also need to enhance the adaptive capacities by managing soil, organic matter, water management, by making more efficient irrigation and also conserving water, increase also the, the management of agrobiodiversity, not only genetic diversity, but species diversity. And I think also once we develop the systems, we need to assess them and we need therefore to develop methodologies that assess the resiliency of the systems that we are going to be trying. So what is the uh, definition of resiliency? In agroecology, we, we say that uh, resilience is the propensity of a system to maintain its organizational structure and productivity after a perturbation. And this can be uh, a frequent stressful event, uh, a cumulative event, or an unpredictable event, just like uh, some of the uh, climatic uh, events that are unpredictable. And resiliency exhibits two properties. One is the resistance that the system has to the shock, and the other one, the capacity to recover after the shock. So for example, a, a crop system, the yields uh, are not that affected by, 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 by a particular event, or they are affected, but then they recover to more or less the original level, so that, that means that the system is re resilient. So a resilient agroecosystem, therefore, is able to still produce food after suffering the effects of a, of a climatic event, or given a sudden increase in the cost of petroleum or any other um, type of uh, shock that is affecting the system. So, when we talk about enhancing the resilience of farming systems, we can take three approaches that are complementary, obviously. One um, is the management of the surrounding landscape. Uh, the matrix that surrounds agricultural systems, as we will see, has a huge event, uh, impact on, on the resiliency of the systems to climate change. We can also manage the, complexi the complexity of the vegetation. We can diversify the systems with rotations, polycropping systems, agroforestry systems, with animal integration, or we can also increase the genetic diversity by using different varieties of crops that are going to exhibit different levels of sensitivity. And then obviously we need to manage the soil, increase the organic matter uh, content of the soil, the soil cover, and obviously we can also manage water in the system and also harvest water during the times of, uh, of, of rain, because sometimes yeah, like last year, you know, it only rained maybe a month in California or two months, and, uh, and then the rest it didn't. But when it rained, there was a lot of water that can be harvested and then utilized during the dry season. So we use two pillars uh, that, uh, for, for in building the resiliency or the health of the system. The first one is the management of the uh, below ground or the soil um, component by increasing organic matter, activating biologically that soil, because microorganisms, the complex microorganisms, can play a very important role, as we will see in, 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 in drought uh, resistance. And then we uh, can manage above ground biodiversity by enhancing the crop diversity of the system through different arrangements in, 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 in time and, and space. So what are some of the management techniques that we can use at the, at, at the level of uh, the below ground that is conserving water in the soil? Uh, the first, obviously, is to capture the maximum percent of rainfall through infiltration. We need to improve the soil structure so that infiltration takes place. We can also enhance the capacity of water storage in the soil by enhancing organic matter content. We need to also have an efficient recovery and use of stored water, that is, by having crops that have a good root development or having crops that are mixed different species that have different rooting depths and therefore explore the whole soil profile for absorbing the water. Capture of water loss to deep soil horizons, like for example trees that have deep root systems can be incorporated into cropping systems in the form of agroforestry systems. And then obviously the last one is the, the water harvesting in the, in the rainy season to preserve the water for the, the, the next season. So organic matter uh, and soil cover are two key management techniques that organic farmers and also conventional farmers can use. Because organic matter, as we know, uh, the first two, three centimeters of the soil, which is the uh, A0 horizon, um, uh, is very, very important in improving the structure of the soil, which leads to higher infiltration and also increases the water holding capacity because organic matter absorbs more than its volume in in, in water. And here you can see that as we increase the organic matter content by, by, by weight in the soil, the percent of water by volume also increases. And that, you know, 
basically is very, very important, therefore, for uh, drought management to have soils that are rich in organic matter. And here we have uh, results from an experiment that was done uh, in Rodale, in an experiment station in Pennsylvania. Uh, they have the, had a long-term rotation system, a conventional versus an organic with corn and soybean and other crops. And they found that in the dry years, as you can see there in the green bar, the organic farming systems have much higher yield than the conventional ones. And that's connected on the one side to the higher content of organic matter in that soil that allows for water conservation and then uh, makes the system more resilient during times of drought. But also, it turns out that when we enhance organic matter in the soil, we also enhance the biotic complexity of the soil. There is very complex food webs of organisms that are interacting, and one of them are the um, mycorrhizae, especially the ectomycorrhizae, which colonize the roots of the, of the, of the crops. And a lot of, they have a lot of effects, but two of the major effects is that they increase the, or, the, the overall absorption capacity of the roots in terms of water and nutrients, and also allows the adaptation of plants to uh, environmental stresses, especially uh, water uh, stress. So these mycorrhi mycorrhizal fungi, therefore, are very, very important, as well as many other microorganisms that are playing key roles in maintaining uh, uh, root health and soil health. Now, soil cover, obviously, reduces evaporation and increases infiltration. And so, so all the techniques that have to do with uh, mulching um, is, is something that is very important in order to um, conserve water uh, and therefore reduce evaporation. Here you can see uh, some farmers in vineyards here in California that had cover crops. They cut the cover crop and then they place it on rows as a mulch, therefore reducing the evaporation on the row and conserving a lot of the, uh, of the water that is going to be um, <clears throat> irrigated with drip. So therefore, there's going to be much more concentration of, of moisture uh, 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 under that cover. And here you can see that also mulching can increase uh, the infiltration. So you can see that as we increase the, the thickness of the mulch, the, the, the water, you can see that the infiltration increases in, in when we measure it in inches per, per hour, for example. So there is definitely an effect of the mulch on infiltration, which, as we mentioned before, is an important aspect of uh, water use. We have done some experiments in, in Berkeley um, where we uh, have been subjecting bean cropping systems to different regimes of uh, water management and also combinations of mulch and organic matter. So here you can see the trial that, that we did last year and that we're replicating this year again where we have uh, beans being uh, <clears throat> watered every five days for 15 minutes or 10 days or every 20 days or every 30 days for 15 minutes. But the bean systems are subject to different treatments, like compost plus mulch, only mulch, only compost, or a control without any mulch or any organic matter. And what is interesting, if you, you concentrate on this slide and this part of the slide here, you can see that this is the system without any, um, any mulch or any organic matter at 30, uh, 30 days of watering 15 minutes, 15 minutes every 30 days. And you can see that when you have organic matter, the yields go up. When you have mulch, the yields are not as, as good as, as in, the, in the control. But then when you have mulch and organic matter, there's a synergistic effect. So you can see that you can enhance the resiliency of the system under very stressful water situations by enhancing uh, organic matter content and by putting mulch in that system because you reduce evaporation but you, at the same time, increase the water uh, holding capacity of the soil. Cover cropping is another technique that many uh, vineyards and uh, people managing orchards uh, use, uh, usually in the winter. And then they come in and they, they turn them under, or they incorporate them, or they cut them. And um, in, the cover crops, depending on the mixture, they usually have 20% uh, um, uh, of uh, cereals and maybe 80% of uh, legumes, and they increase the soil organic matter and the water storage, as you can see here. These are systems with uh, conventional tillage, and this is with the green manures that have been incorporated, how you increase the, the water holding capacity, the, uh, the humidity of the soil increases with, with these cover crops. Now, <clears throat> in California, while growers may need to irrigate more with cover crops, a little bit more, like 25% more, such covers uh, as oats, rye, vetch, red clover, and soup clovers, 
help water penetrate to improve the plant's water use efficiency. And at the same time, <clears throat> when you use cover crops, you have other multiple effects like reducing pests and weeds and fertilizer needs, and therefore the reduction in pesticide, herbicide, and fertilizer inputs due to the cover crop ecological effects can offset the, irrigation, the ex extra irrigation costs. Obviously, <clears throat> water harvesting in, 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 in the farms is a very, very important technique so that you can take advantage of the rainy season and store that water to be used uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dry season. And obviously, you have to farm a certain amount of area depending on how much water you're going to have available. Uh, <clears throat> this is another technique, for example, of uh, conserving moisture in the Canary Islands uh, with, 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 with grapes that allows for First of all, these walls uh, are have a, a, a microclimatic effect of uh, stopping the effects of the, of the wind, therefore there's not so much effect uh, evaporation, but at the same time here there's a concentration of manure and organic matter that actually enhances the water holding capacity of those graves. Or har water harvesting from the roofs. Uh, this is a technique that is used in many developing countries where people are subject to droughts or to long dry periods like here in California in the Mediterranean climate, you can actually um, store water and capture water from the rainy season, then use it for home gardens that are going to increase the food security of the family. Now, as I said before, divers that, that would be the, <clears throat> the aspects of soil and water management. Now, diversification of the system at the landscape level and at the field level is very important. For example, we know that the landscape matrix influences on farm resiliency. If you have a farm that is surrounded by other farms that are monocultures versus farms that are surrounded by forest, a lot of research is showing that the behavior, the ecological behavior or performance of the farm that is surrounded by a complex matrix is totally different from the, from the one that is surrounded by a very simple one. So if here, for example, we have a vineyard that is not surrounded by forest and this one that is surrounded by forest, you would expect that the dynamics of pests and diseases, but also the water dynamics of the system also changes. Why? Because this vegetational matrix has an effect on the local water cycle. And therefore, we would expect that you have a much more close water cycle and less uh, loss of water in a system like, uh, like, like that I'm showing here in the slide. Now, crop diversity um, can enhance the resilience of agroecosystems and protect production capacity in many, many ways including the protection of crops against extreme weather effects and fluctuations in temperature and precipitation. Uh, so therefore, the, a lot of organic farmers are very interested in reintroducing diversity in their, into their cropping systems. In this case would be vineyards where you grow cover crops, not only winter cover crops, but also summer cover crops that can have an important effect on pests. Our research for many years has shown that incorporating plants, uh, flowering plants, like for example, in, in the early season, um, alisum and buckwheat and can enhance the populations of beneficial insects and predators and parasitoids that, they are f that then go up to the, to the vines and control the, the insect pests, especially leafhoppers. And then in the more dry summer, uh, let's talk about June and so on, you can grow certain plants like um, am amni or wild carrot that are, that are drought resistant because of their very deep root and then maintain populations of beneficials that are going to be controlling the pests, uh, even in the, very more, in the very dry season when you don't have any water available to put here in between the rows. So crop diversification can reduce a lot of risks. For example, this is a system that I am familiar with in Chile, where you have grapes intercropped with beans. The beans obviously fix nitrogen, but at the same time, you know, if you lose the grapes, you have the beans. If you lose the beans, you have the grapes. So intercropping is a very important uh, technique to enhance crop diversity in, 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 in agricultural systems. And this is used uh, throughout the developing world. And there are some organic farmers that, that are trying this technique here in California. Strip intercropping, for example, in the Midwest has shown to be a very interesting approach, not only to enhance, uh, to reduce risk because of the diversity that you have, but also it makes economic sense. For example, here you can see uh, the comparisons between monocultures and strip cropping. And here you have the difference in income. And in five years, except on this last year, uh, the intercropping system the, had a, an advantage, uh, an income gain of $83 per acre. Uh, why? Because you're reducing the need of water, the need of pesticides, the need of fertilizers. And you create this 
systems that are able, to, the psychological infrastructure that sponsors the functioning of the system without external inputs. So there are two types of diversity. One is the functional diversity, the various components of the farm, the plants, the animals, the soil organisms, provide a variety of ecological services to the agroecosystem. And then there's a responsive diversity, which is that each component uh, exhibits a range of responses to uh, environmental change. So the more components you have, the more options of, of responses you would have to environmental change. And then this functional diversity works in two ways. One, you have compensation. Different species play different roles and occupy different niches. But if one species fails, the other can replace its function. Or what is called redundancy, which is another emerging property in which a diverse agroecosystem has more species than functions. Well, it turns out that those components that appear to be the redundant, and you know, they're there, you know, you don't know why, it be, they become important when an environmental change occurs. So having redundancy is very, very important for resilience in agroecosystems. I have some examples from other countries to show that, you know, um, the diversity basically reduces um, the, the, the extreme, the impacts of extreme weather effects like hurricanes. Uh, this is the, the impacts of Mitch in Central America that happened back in the early 90s. And you can see that the farmers that did not have diversity, they had monocultures, suffered tremendous losses through mudslides uh, compared to this farm that was about 200 meters away from the one that I showed you before that has a lot of diversity and actually, the studies that were done on this show that in Guatemala, in, in Honduras, where Mitch hit the hardest, you can see that the amount of mudslides in the agroecological diversified farms was much lower than in the monocultures. Uh, the same thing happened in Cuba in, in 2008. Uh, there was a hurricane Ike, and showed that the, the average loss in diversified farms was about 50% compared to 90 and 100% in the monocultures. So these are the kinds of farms that survived especially the ones that have agroforestry patterns, but also hedgerows that it can protect against the strong winds. And here you can see the recovery capacity of the diversified farms. This is 60 days after the event, and this is the recovery of productivity of the most diversified farms, like three and two. And this one, one, was a monoculture that, as you can see, very slow recovery to the, to the impact of the, of the hurricane. Animal integration, obviously, uh, is very important. Uh, animals that graze in orchards, on vineyards, uh, can have a huge impact on, on organic matter content and by also selecting certain vegetation that, that could be useful. And that increases water holding capacity, improves uh, structure of the soil. So animal integration is definitely a very important component in, in, in introducing diversity to agroecosystems for resiliency. The last part of my talk talks about, <clears throat> well, let's say now we use these principles, you know, maintaining soil cover, increasing organic matter content, enhancing diversity in time and space, genetic diversity, species diversity at the field level, at the landscape level, and you design systems, but then you want to assess whether these systems are really resilient or not. So we have been working uh, with a group of scientists in Latin America where we are assessing what is called the risk uh, uh, that is associated with a climatic event, which would be equal to the threat, the vulnerability, plus the vulnerability divided by the reactive capacity and, and recovery capacity of the system. So <clears throat> let's say the risk is the damage level and um, it, let's say the, the amount of loss of the yield loss that you experience. So you have a climatic, a climatic threat, let's say a drought. Well, how frequent, the intensity, the duration, okay? That's important because that's going to de determine the amount of risk. But at the same time, the risk or the losses that you experience are going to be associated with the vulnerability of your system. Is it, is it surrounded by natural forests or not? Is it a monoculture or not? Does it have soil organic matter? Are you using soil cover? What is the slope, the exposure of the system? Um, th those are very important um, aspects that are going to explain how vulnerable your system is. And that vulnerability could be high or low, depending on whether you have diversity or not, or whether you have organic matter or not, etc. But also, it can be annulated by the reactive capacity. That is, the farmer's knowledge. Do farmers have knowledge on how to deal with, uh, with uh, drought? Uh, what, are, what management skills to enhance resiliency? Do they know about this or not? Um, do they have access to resources, informational resources or monetary resources in order to be able to take action? you know, to improve their resiliency? Do they have a diversity of crops, et cetera, et cetera? So that's the reactive capacity. So um, 
you can measure, you, you can, for example, the vulnerability indicators that we used in a study in Colombia, uh, South America, you can see that you use indicators that are going to give you um, ideas about how vulnerable the system is, like the landscape diversity, the infiltration capacity of the soil, which is connected to the soil structure, the level of compaction, the erosion signs, the slope. And you, can, and you can give them, for example, values from one to five. The closer to five, the less vulnerable the system is. And you can see the, that we survey agroecological farms versus conventional farms, which are mostly monocultures managed with agrochemicals. And you see that the agroecological farms, which are the green um, lines, show that the values of vulnerability are lower because they tend to, to five. So here you can identify which points are low and what can you do about it. Obviously, we cannot do much about the, the slope, but we can do about landscape diversity. We can also enhance here the soil structure with additions of organic matter. We can protect the soil with soil conservation practices and so on. You can also estimate the response cap capacity. So here we have 13 indicators that we used. Some of them are technical indicators, like for example, soil texture, soil cover, living barriers, conservation tillage, water management, and so on terraces, how much food is produced on the farm, seed banks, whether the farmers have seed banks or not, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see again that you know, the agroecological farms have very, very uh, good values in terms of response capacity. That is that they can recover very quickly or they can respond very quickly to enhance, to reduce the vulnerability of their farms. And here you can see that the conventional ones had very low value. So again, you can start then learning and saying, well, how can we move from red to green, what, that, that, that transition is an agroecological transition that you need to manage the system, you need to in, bring in you know, the, the organic matter, the, the soil cover, the crop diversity, and so on and so on into the systems. And then at the end, you have several farms here. You, we have you know, seven farms that we're looking at, and you can put it in a triangle very similar to the soil texture uh, triangle, where you put threat uh, from zero to 100%, vulnerability, and then response capacity, and then these farms that are here in this area are very, very, at a very high risk. And these are medium risk, and these are very low risk. So you can see that the agroecological farms that we survey are in this area of low risk, and these farms here that are uh, more conventional are more in a medium risk area. So what we need to do now is how we're gonna bring these farms to this area through management techniques that are of agroecological nature, as I described before. So, to finalize then, how would a resilient farm look like in the future? You know, this is the agriculture of the future. We need to have farms that are gonna be less dependent on petroleum, resilient to climate change, diversified, and, um, and form the basis of local food systems. Well, uh, these farms are gonna be, tend to, be, they're gonna tend to be uh, ecologically self-regulated via feedback loops because of the high level of functional di diversity that they're going to have. There's going to be a lot of connectivity between the components so that these feedback loops can take place. So microorganisms in the soil with the plants, with the insects and the animals and the companion plants are all going to be interacting. Uh, there's going to be high levels of redundancy, as I said before, is an important emerging property. Very high spatial and temporal heterogeneity at the field and landscape level. So you're going to see mosaics of crops surrounded by forests or natural vegetation. And all of this is going to lead to systems that are going to have high levels of autonomy from external inputs and control, but more than anything, resilient systems that are going to be able to you know, uh, resist shock, but at the same time be able to recover uh, from these climatic events for which farmers have no much control. And they're going to become the norm rather than the exception in the future.